Hi, and welcome to today's lesson in U.S. history with Mr. Snyder. Today, we're going to jump a little bit back and talk about Nixon's foreign policy and a couple new terms, and he takes it in kind of a different direction from previous presidents. So your two learning targets today are to explain the reasoning behind Nixon's foreign policy and then define his foreign policy toward uh, the Soviet Union and China. So just to review, kind of going back to post-World War II foreign policies, Truman containing communism, Eisenhower changes it up and makes it a little more aggressive to massive retaliation, and he coins the term the domino theory for Vietnam. Uh, Kennedy changes it yet again back to flexible response. Johnson is a combo of the domino theory and containment. Nixon, with the winding down of the Vietnam War, kind of takes it in a completely opposite direction with terms known as realpolitik and détente. So German word, French word. N Henry Kissinger is Nixon's uh, advisor, and he is a proponent of realpolitik. And it means like real, a real politic. And so... He's saying that political goals should not be defined um, such as in communism versus non-communism. Like, we can't deal with any communist nation whatsoever. That's not the way that we should define our foreign policy. Those would be abstract ideologies. He's saying if the United States wants to do something and China wants to do the same thing, then we should work together regardless of whether they are communist or not. And so real, uh, realpolitik changes some basic Cold War assumptions about communism. From Truman through uh, Johnson, there is no worldwide communist movement directed from Russia. There's just not. As we learned in South Vietnam, they wanted to be communists, but it wasn't from Russian influence. It was simply because of the way that they were designed to do it. And so foreign policy... We need to remain flexible and avoid what's called an ideological absolute, as in all communism is bad. Well, not all communism is bad, especially if we can uh, work with and trade with the communist country that is communist. And so I hope that all made sense to you. Um, if you have any questions, you can bring them up in class. So... The United States and Soviet Union tensions ease, and we enter a period that's known as détente, which is the French word for calm or relaxing, and it means the, e the period of easing tensions between the Soviet Union and the uh, United States, and this basically is the 1970s. This replaces previous policies of suspicion and distrust, and it all starts with our relations with China. Nixon aims at some peaceful relations with the Soviets by engaging in ping-pong diplomacy. And this is the scene in Forrest Gump where he's on the national ping-pong team. He sends, at, an, at the invitation of China, he sends the U.S. table tennis team to China. And they're the first Americans to visit China since 1949. And he does this because if we become friends with China, communist China, it could drive a wedge between China and the Soviet Union. So after ping-pong diplomacy, Nixon decides to begin the process to diplomatically recognize communist China. And there's three reasons. They are a growing nation, and it could improve trade. We could have a huge trading partner in China, and today they are a huge trading partner. It would drive a wedge between the two communist friends. And it could also have China pressure North Vietnam to end the Vietnam War. And after this ping-pong diplomacy, Nixon visits China for about 10 days and has a great time, meets all the leaders, uh, sees all the sites. Tourists are allowed to follow. And normalized relations between the two countries are complete by 1978. And so now China is our friend, whether or not communism doesn't matter. If they're communist, great. If they're not, even better. But if they are, we can still get along with them and work with them on things like trade. 
So after China, in order to avoid being isolated, Soviet letter, uh, leader Leonid Brezhnev invites Nixon to Moscow for, um, for a summit to talk about our differences. He's afraid the, Uni or the Soviet Union would be isolated. And what it results in is the first ever strategic arms limitation treaty, or what's called SALT-1, because there is a SALT-2 that we'll talk about here in a little bit uh, in this chapter. But SALT-1 freezes deployment of the intercontinental ballistic middle, uh, missiles and limited um, the ABMs that are created. So this does not necessarily end the arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States, but it's a pretty good start. And so that's the end of the learning targets today. If you have any questions, bring them back to class, uh, fill them out, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.